is Boston in Lincolnshire on the east coast of England and behind me is St Botolph's Church, the largest purpose-built parish church in the whole of England. Its tower is known as Boston Stump, mainly because of its stumpy appearance. It rises to 272 feet high and it can be seen by ships out at sea coming into Boston Port. The tallest church tower in the world and a medieval engineering miracle standing on massive limestone foundations. And here, on the south side of the tower, you can look across the wash to Hun Stanton in Norfolk. Here, the River Witham runs past the Great Tower on its way into the wash. And on a clear day, you can see all the way to Lincoln and see Lincoln Cathedral in the distance. This is a Lincolnshire longwool fleece from the back of a Lincolnshire longwool sheep. In the 14th century, this was regarded as the finest wool in Europe and up to three million of these were exported from Boston every year to ports all round Northern Europe by the merchants of the Hanseatic League. The merchants would often gamble on the future price of this wool and they would place their bids on a giant checkered board and that is where we get the title the Chancellor of the Exchequer. It was the wealth from this fleece that paid for the glories of this fantastic church. By the middle of the 14th century, Boston was second only to London in terms of its importance as a medieval port. It was the fourth largest town in England. Today, Boston is a great agricultural centre and on a bustling market day like today, you can hear many European languages spoken here in the marketplace. Boston has one of the oldest recorded church libraries here above the entrance porch and I'm standing here with Ernie Napier who is the chairman of the library committee. Um, one of its most ancient books is this copy of Fox's Book of Martyrs but Ernie I believe you have a much earlier manuscript in front of you. Yes we have. Um, in front of me now is the, well it's a commentary on the book of Genesis originally written by St Augustine. This was copied in 1170 in Pontefract by some poor monk or monks, and it's a uh, on vellum. It's got oh, that's, that's animal skin, isn't animal it? Animal skin, it is. That's yeah. right. It's got some interesting uh, illuminations on it. Uh, this is the front page of it, and the, this is probably the best illuminated page here. But uh, in fact, if you turn over the pages, you'll find where uh, the animal skin has actually been actually been uh, sewn because it's such an expensive product that they have mm -hmm. to use as much as they can. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, Any idea how long it would take to have written this book? I have no idea, but you just look at it, just imagine being in a cell, a desk against a window, mixing your own ink, using quills that need to be sharpened. Imagine mm. how long it would take just to do a page. Mm. The place where it's been scored, you can see the lines down. Fox's Book of Martyrs, well that goes back to 1637, uh, probably an original 1563, the marvellous, and it was course all done by hand. Mm -hmm. And they would have flat beds and set the type up and then rolled paper over the top of it. Right. Well, it's a beautiful copy. It's a beautiful copy. Yeah. It really is. I wonder how many books today will last as long as even this one, <laughs> yes. 300 years. Yes, you wonder. Yeah. One wonders. During the Reformation, many of this church's great treasures were sold off or simply destroyed. A few traces remain though. Underneath here, the choir seats, the beautifully carved misericords, and under this seat, you can see two dragons rubbing noses. Nicholas Pugin, the great Victorian neo-Gothic designer, was responsible for the design of this present baptism font. Above, 
you can see the nave arches leaning, although they are structurally sound due to the pressure exerted by the great tower above. The church was also a rich source of medieval music, especially the Elizabethan composer John Tavener, who began his career here as a composer in 1524 and was later buried here beneath the tower in 1545. When Henry VIII dissolved the monasteries, churches like Boston were stripped of all their riches and they were sold off or simply burned. The new Puritan age saw religious dissenters trying to break away from the established church. A group of separatists travelling from Scrooby in Nottinghamshire arrived secretly in Boston in 1607. They hired a boat to take themselves across the sea to Holland but were arrested here at Scotia Creek. An event commemorated by this memorial which reads Near this place, in September 1607, those later known as the Pilgrim Fathers were thwarted in their first attempt to sail to find religious freedom across the seas. Following their arrest, the Pilgrim Fathers were brought here to Boston Guildhall and tried upstairs in the courtroom. Afterwards, they were brought down here and imprisoned in these cells. The Pilgrim Fathers, who had separated from the Church of England, finally sailed on the Mayflower from Plymouth in England and founded Plymouth, America in 1620. An eloquent Puritan preacher, John Cotton, was appointed to this church in 1612 and his long sermons delivered from this very pulpit inspired many wealthy, often educated people these Puritans sailed in 1630 on the Winthrop fleet and founded Boston, Massachusetts on September the 7th. They founded a free school based on Boston Grammar School, which eventually became Boston Latin School. Boston has several historic buildings, all telling stories of events and people which mark the town and sometimes the nation's history. Fidel House is said to be the finest house in Boston. Pescod Hall is a merchant's restoration and Shodfriars Hall is a Victorian reconstruction of a great Elizabethan merchant's townhouse. It once accommodated a theatre in which a famous local music hall star, Arthur Lucan, born in nearby Sibsey, began his career. Aww. Later achieving fame as a comic oh, female oh, impersonator, oh, old, old Mother old Riley. The Guildhall Museum, scene of the Pilgrim Father's trial, was built around 1390 for the wealthy merchants of St Mary's Guild an amazing survivor from Boston's medieval history and it still retains its medieval kitchens. Queen Elizabeth I commanded Boston to keep the waters of the wash safe and to this day the town mayor wears an admiral's hat and enjoys the title Admiral of the Wash. Sir Joseph Banks the great scientist and botanist who accompanied Captain Cook on many of his great expeditions. He became recorder of Boston. Just outside the town is Hussey Tower, the remains of a great Tudor mansion originally owned by Lord Hussey, who was executed by Henry VIII. The Stump Tower dominates the marketplace where Wednesday and Saturday markets thrive along with the annual May Fair. A famous Boston poet is Jean Inglow, whose poem, The High Tide on the Coast of Lincolnshire, 1571, commemorates a terrible flood which devastated the town. The old mayor climbed the belfry tower. The ringers ran in two by three. Pull if he never pulled before. Good ringers, pull your best, quote he. Play up, play up, O oh Boston Bells. Ply all your changes, all your swells. Play up the Brides of Enderby. 
Old sea wall, he cried, is down. The rising tide comes on apace, and boats are drifting yonder town. Go floating through the marketplace. Boston has one of the tallest windmills in the country. The Maud Foster windmill was originally built by the Reckitt brothers in 1819, one of whom later co-founded the famous Reckitt and Coleman Food Company. Boston is still a commercially operating seaport, connecting with other seaports all over Europe, as well as offering tourism visits out to see the seal colonies on the wash. The port's historic connections are celebrated by periodic visits by historic sailing ships, such as the replica of the Endeavour, celebrating famous explorers such as Matthew Flinders, the man who named Australia. A day in Boston is like stepping back into a thousand years of maritime trade and history. And even today, it is a vibrant market town, as well as a wonderful heritage site and a place of worship. 